All right, everybody. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the Dharma Doors, and I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we're going to read a sutra. We're going to talk about a sutra. Um, we are still in the middle length discourses, the Majima Nikaya. We're going to be moving on to sutra number 19 tonight, the Devedaha Vitaka Sutta, two kinds of thought or two kinds of Vitaka. So we're going to talk about Vitaka tonight. Um, hold on one second. I just lost a very important page. There we go. Cool. All right. So um, we, we've got a lot to talk about, actually. And I want to, I'm going to do a little bit more talking before the reading, because I kind of want to make everything clear. Then we'll go ahead and do the reading. But tonight's sutra is is going to be, um, well, tonight's sutra, the focus of it, you could say, even though it, it's not a word that occurs in the text, but it's a word you should be aware of, tonight, the big thing that we're doing, or the big thing that we're talking about, is bhavana. So bhavana is a Buddhist word. And it's a tricky word because, well, it can be translated a bunch of different ways, but it it's kind of one of those, it's another word for meditation, bhavana. But as you know, in Buddhism, there's a lot of different kind of modalities of meditation. So one easy way to think about it is that the word bhavana it's sometimes translated as the work or the training. If you have, or if you're familiar with the Tibetan Buddhist idea of mind training, the training part of it is bhavana, the work. So we have an umbrella idea of the, the work that is to be done, the practice, the cultivation, that's all bhavana. Underneath the umbrella of bhavana, there are two primary modalities of Buddhist meditation. One is called shamatha, and the other is vipassana. So calming down and then gaining insight or kind of doing contemplation. Vipassana, insight. So those two modalities of kind of stillness, calming down, focusing, shamatha, calming, and then insight, contemplation. So those are these two modalities that are both part of the work. So the bhavana, the cultivation or the work, is doing both of those. And the sutra that we're going to look at tonight is a very good sutra at, well, it's a good sutra at actually outlining the practice. Like, what are we supposed to do when we're meditating? Like, what exactly are we supposed to do? Well, tonight is a great sutra for understanding that. Now, this sutra, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this sutra it's another one of those interesting sutras where the Buddha introduces it as back when I was an unenlightened bodhisattva. And so it's a sutra where the Buddha is telling the, the group about the six years when he was sort of solo doing austerities and kind of just figuring it out in a way. And so the thing that I always like about the sutras that are where the Buddha is talking about his cultivation and talking about his days as an unenlightened bodhisattva, I really like those sutras because, as I've said this before, but they are rather, in a way, they are descriptive rather than prescriptive. 
So uh, most sutras are prescriptive, like meaning you should do this. This is this would be a good idea for you to do these things. So it's a prescription. But some sutras like this one are actually descriptive. So they're describing the Buddha's awakening experience. And I sort of really like those sutras where they are descriptive rather than prescriptive in that way. So <clears throat> now a couple of things that we need to know going into this. So this sutra tonight, which is called the Devedaha Vitaka Sutta, the two kinds of vitaka. In Sanskrit, the word is vitarka. So it's just a slight different pronunciation between vitaka and vitarka. But in the world of Buddhism, vitaka or vitarka is always coupled with vichara. And in many ways, they're actually a, a hyphenated expression, vitaka vichara. Now, we need to talk about this because the whole sutra is actually about vitaka and vichara. So let's talk about it. We're pulling back and we're just going to now think about how, well, Buddhism, all of Buddhism, the history of Buddhism, it's a very psychologically oriented tradition. Yes, there's a lot of focus on morality, but as I know you know, there's a lot of focus on the mind. And so part of, <clears throat> excuse me, part of basic, like super basic Buddhist psychology, they make a difference between two functions of the mind. The mind can be doing, and so this is a, a verb. The mind can be doing vitaka, or again, vitarka. And your mind, and by the way, this has nothing to do with meditation yet. That's It's why I kind of gestured that we're going to pull back, and we're just talking about the way the mind works. And in Buddhism, the Buddha detected that the mind works in these two different ways that work together. Vitaka is a kind of searching. And what it is, is it's the mind looking around for something to think about. So Vitaka is like, well, looking around in that way. Once you have found something like that maybe it catches your attention or somebody has suggested, hey, think about this. When the mind stops looking around and it moves into the mode of thinking about the thing that it has now found, the mind ceases doing vitaka or vitarka and it moves into doing vichara, con what would be translated as contemplation. It is sustained thinking about something. Going back, vitarka is the looking around in that way. And it actually, what's really interesting is, is that the, the, the tradition, the Buddhist tradition, they spend a lot of time investigating and talking about the way these two work together all the time. Like even right now, you can notice if your mind is in a vitaka mode or a vichara mode. Now, part of the idea or part of the problem is that the mind is in overdrive. And so like the proverbial drunk monkey jumping from branch to branch, the normal mind is in vitarka, vichara, vitaka, vichara, vitaka, vichara, and basically looking and looking and finding and then dispensing and looking and looking and finding and dispensing and not spending very long focusing on something and contemplating it. 
So tonight, the Buddha is going to talk a lot about, well, Vitaka and Vichara. And these words get translated all kinds of different ways. And you need to know, or you should know, they're sort of like, the both of these words, Vitaka and Vichara, they are used in a kind of just, you know, a very general way. And they both sort of basically are thinking. But then in the Buddhist tradition, these words take on very specific meanings. And I've given you the very specific meanings, which is that Vitarka or Vitaka is about kind of investigating or looking around. And Vichara is sustained attention on something. So this sutra, the Buddha is going to be talking about these two different kinds of vitaka. And so what the Buddha is going to be describing, and I'm going to kind of actually paraphrase the sutra really quickly, then we'll read it. But the Buddha basically says, yeah, when I, before I was enlightened, I was doing meditation practice and I thought it would be a good idea to separate thoughts into two different categories. And those really quickly, those categories are going to be what are called unwholesome states and wholesome states. An unwholesome state, they're gonna be listed as three. In a state full of sensual desire or kama, in a state or full of vyapada, ill will, being pissed off. Or third, an unwholesome state of being full of violence or cruelty, himsa. All right. So those are the three unwholesome states, sensual desire, kama, which we've talked a lot about in the last few Dharma doors, ill will and being cruel or violent. So these are going to be these three unwholesome states that the Buddha is going to talk about. And then he's going to say, or there's sensations that arise or feelings that arise that are wholesome. And so rather than sensual desire, it will be the tendency or the thought of relinquishment, of renunciation, not grasping or clinging after desires, but actually not doing that. So that's one wholesome state that corresponds to sensual desire. And then the Buddha talks about not ill will, so avyapada, so not having ill will, and ahimsa, not being violent or cruel. So the exact opposites of those three unwholesome states. Now, throughout the sutra, the Buddha does use the terms renunciation, non-ill will, and non-cruelty. However, the translator makes a note that those, the way that the sutra reads, those are in the form of the negative, meaning not having kama. The word is nekama, nekahama, which means not having kama. <laughs> so renouncing kama. So it's not kama, not ill will, not cruelty. But the translator notes that in other texts, you could speak about these in the positive. And in particular, it's about how rather than talking about non-ill will, we talk about metta, loving kindness. And rather than talking about cruelty or violence, we talk about compassion, karunya. Tonight, I'm, I might vacillate between those, but I'm going to probably translate it as loving kindness and compassion. 
because I, I like to say those words more than I like to say the word violence and ill will, even though I'm saying non ill will, I prefer the positive. So I'm going to take Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote advice and accentuate the positive, as they say. But back to the work, back to the bhavana. So the Buddha says, I thought it would be a good idea to separate these emotions or these states of mind into these two categories. And then he begins a process of meditation in which it begins with vitaka, vitarka. And what that is, is the looking around. And what's going to happen is that as you are meditating and you are aware and you're looking around, and I don't mean, by the way, I don't mean looking around the room, but I mean being aware of like emotional states and feelings and sensations and you know, states of mind, but you are in a in an open looking around vitarka or vitaka mode. And then a sensation arises. And that sensation might be kama about sensual desire. It might be a thought of being pissed off and angry at somebody. It might be a thought of being violent or cruel for some reason. Or it might be a thought of renunciation or a thought of loving kindness or a thought of compassion. But the point is the vitarka or the vitaka is being like, oh, look, I'm horny. I got turned on all of a sudden. Then we move into vichara. So vitaka, we were on the lookout for sensations. Oh, look, sexual stimulation. Now we move into vichara where we observe, and the Buddha is going to tell us how to do that, but then we observe and contemplate that arisen dharma, whether it's a wholesome dharma or an unwholesome dharma in that way. So that's going to be how the Buddha is going to talk about vitarka and vichara working together, where we're on the lookout. And then once we notice something, we move to vichara, we pay attention to it. And in the sutra, the Buddha is going to give, or he's going to describe a number of different things that we're going to consider about either these unwholesome states or these wholesome states. And that question, or not question, but that analysis where... The Buddha is going to notice the arising of, let's say, again, let's say a feeling of ill will. And he's going to say, and then I investigated, I, I contemplated that. And I thought, this feeling of ill will, it doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do other people any good. It doesn't do both of us any good. I should probably abandon it since it's not doing anybody any good. That, what I just described, which we're going to hear again when I do the reading, that's vipassana. That's the investigative work of looking at this dharma and realizing this isn't helping me. So now we're beginning to notice how all of these things are working together. So we're on the lookout. We've noticed a sensation, we focus our attention, and then we contemplate it in an insightful mode, in a vipassana mode. And that could lead to its abandonment or its renunciation or its coming to cessation. All right. So now I've kind of basically explained the umbrella idea of bhavana. The, I haven't talked actually about calming yet, but I've talked about doing vitarka and then vichara and interestingly i'm just going to tell you this now so that you'll notice it what the buddha is going to say though is that all of that contemplation all of that investigation it can become a strain on the mind and so he says i 
turned it off. I mean, you, it's not his language, but he basically says, I stopped doing that investigation. And that, and the way it's described, that's moving into the calming or shamatha mode. Because the Buddha even says that I noticed myself basically getting a little too excited, mentally speaking. And so he shifts into shamatha, just calming down and calming down until there's the recognition of the arising of a sensation and then the whole thing begins over again. So that's going to be the bhavana. That's the work that we're going to be looking at. And then what we want to be really paying attention to is the way the Buddha is working with all of these things. So the vitaka, the vichara, the vipassana, and then the shamatha, and then back to the vitaka in that way. And then as it goes along, <clears throat> it will kind of, um, it'll move into a very classic description of the four jhanas. It's a you know very classic part of early Buddhist sutras that we go through the four jhanas again, especially when we're describing the Buddha's enlightenment experience. What I want us to, or when we get there, the four jhanas, like moving through the four jhanas, it has a lot to do actually with vitarka and vichara. But then in the second jhana, there is the abandonment of vitarka and vichaya. Now, this is what I was trying to say, say something earlier. Normally, even when I teach it, in the second jhana, I just describe it as it is the relinquishment of discursive thinking. Discursive thinking is like mental chatter, an internal dialogue, an internal voice. Again, normally I just gloss that as discursive thought, but it's actually about the relinquishment of vitarka and vichaya, or vichara, sorry. And now having read the, or once we read the whole sutra and we understand the role of vitaka and vichara in getting us to the jhanas, I think it'll make a little even more sense the moment when we let go of that activity and then off into these jhanas. So, all right. I think that's all I have to prepare us. Any questions, comments, or ideas before we dive into the sutta? All sound good? All right. So once again, this is the Devedaha Vitaka Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 19. Page 207, if you happen to have the Wisdom Publication Edition. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sabati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pintika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, the, the bhikkhus replied. And the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes, then I sat on one side, thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And I sat on the other side, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of loving kindness, non-ill will, and thoughts of compassion, non-cruelty. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus, this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction. It leads to others' affliction, and it leads to the affliction of both of us. 
It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from nirvana. When I considered, this leads to my own affliction. It subsided in me. When I considered, this leads to others' affliction. It subsided in me. When I considered, this leads to the affliction of both of us. It subsided in me. When I considered, this obstructs wisdom. This causes difficulties. And it leads away from nirvana. It subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it. I removed it. I did away with it. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of ill will arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of ill will has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from nirvana. When I considered, this leads to my own affliction. It subsided in me. When I considered, this leads to others' affliction. It subsided in me. When I considered, this leads to the affliction of both. It subsided in me. When I considered, this obstructs wisdom. It causes difficulties, and it leads away from nirvana. It subsided in me. As I abided thus, or whenever a thought of ill will arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of cruelty arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of cruelty has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from nirvana. When I considered thus, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of cruelty arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it. Bhikkhus, whenever anyone frequently vitarkas, thinks about, and vicharas, ponders, or ponders upon. Once again, bhikkhus, whatever anyone frequently thinks about and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. If they frequently think and ponder about thoughts of sensual desire, they have abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate thoughts of sensual desire. If they th frequently think about and ponder upon thoughts of ill will, then they have abandoned the thought of loving kindness. If they frequently think about and ponder thoughts of cruelty, then they have abandoned thoughts of compassion to cultivate thoughts of cruelty. And then the mind inclines towards thoughts of cruelty. Just like in the last month of the rainy season, in the autumn, when the crops thicken, a cow herder would guard the cows by constantly tapping and poking them on the side, and that with a stick to check and curb them. And why would they do that? Because the herder sees that they could get flogged, that they could get imprisoned, that they could get fined, or they could get blamed if they let the cows stray into the crops. So too, I saw in unwholesome states, danger, degradation, and defilement. And I saw in wholesome states, the blessing of renunciation, the aspect of cleansing, as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, 
a thought of renouncing sensual desire occurred in me. I understood thus. This thought of renunciation has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction. It does not lead to others' affliction. It doesn't lead to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom. It does not cause difficulties, and it leads to nirvana. If I think and ponder upon this thought, even for a whole night, even for a day, even for a whole night and a day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive vitakka and excessive vichara, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from concentrated. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted it, brought it to singleness, and concentrated it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be strained. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of loving kindness arose in me, and I understood thus. This thought of loving kindness has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction, or to others' affliction, or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom. It does not cause difficulties and leads to nirvana. If I think and ponder about this thought even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and a day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from concentrated. So I steadied my mind <clears throat> internally, quieted it, and brought it to singleness and concentrated it. And why is that? So that my mind should not be strained. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of compassion arose in me. I understood this thus. This thought of compassion has arisen in me. This does not lead to my affliction or to others' affliction, or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom. It does not cause difficulties, and it leads to nirvana. If I think and ponder upon this thought even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and a day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from concentrated. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted it, brought it to singleness, and concentrated it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be strained. Bhikkhus. Whatever anyone frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. If they frequently think and ponder upon thoughts of renunciation, they have abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation. And then the mind inclines towards thoughts of renunciation. If they frequently think and ponder upon thoughts of loving kindness, they have abandoned the thought of ill will to cultivate the thought of loving kindness, and then the mind inclines to thoughts of loving kindness. If they frequently think and ponder upon thoughts of compassion, they have abandoned thoughts of cruelty to cultivate thoughts of compassion, and then the mind inclines towards thoughts of compassion. Just like in the last month of the hot season, when all the crops have been brought inside to the villages, a cow herder could guard the cows while abiding at the root of a tree or just out in the open 
since they need only be mindful that the cows are there. So too, there was need for me only to be mindful that those wholesome states were there. Tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained vitaka and vichara, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. With the stilling of vitaka and vichara, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, vitaka and vichara, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration, with the fading away as well of rapture, I abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which the noble ones say, one has a pleasant biting, the one who abides in equanimity and who is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wheely, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. I recollected my manifold past lives, that is, one birth, Two births, three births, four births, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many culpas of world contraction, many culpas of world expansion, many culpas of world contraction and expansion. And I knew there. I was named so-and-so of such-and-such such clan, with such-and-such such appearance, such was my nutriment, such was my experience of pleasure and pain, such was my, li my life term. And then passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there, too, I was named so-and-so. I was of such-and-such such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term. And passing away from there, I reappeared there. Thus, with all their aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me during the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished, and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished, and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of other beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human eye, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass on according to their karmic actions thus. I knew these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, 
upon the dissolution of the body after death, they've reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings, who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of the noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, they've reappeared in a good destination, even in a heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human eye, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understood how beings pass on according to their karmic actions. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the middle watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. These are the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the origin of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the cessation of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the path leading to the cessation of the taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge. It's liberated. I directly knew. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming into any state of being. This was the third true knowledge attained by me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose. As happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. Suppose, bhikkhus, that in a wooded range, there was a great low-lying marsh near which a large herd of deer lived. Then someone appeared desiring their ruin, desiring their harm and bondage, and that person closed off the safe and good path that could be traveled joyfully, and they opened up a false path, and they put up a decoy and set up a dummy so that the large herd of deer might later come upon calamity disaster and loss. But then someone else came desiring their good, their welfare and their protection, and they reopened the safe and good path that led to their happiness, and they closed off the false path, and they removed the decoy and destroyed the dummy so that the large herd of deer might later come to growth increase, and fulfillment. Bhikkhus, I have given this simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning. The great low-lying marsh is a term for sensual pleasures. The large herd of deer is a term for human beings. 
The person desiring their ruin, their harm and bondage, that's a term for Mara, the evil one. The false path is a term for the wrong eightfold path. That is, having the wrong view, setting the wrong intentions, speaking wrongly, acting wrongly, partaking of the wrong livelihood, participating in wrong effort, establishing the wrong mindfulness, and developing wrong concentration. The decoy? That's a term for delight and lust. The dummy? That's a term for ignorance. The person desiring the deer's good, their welfare and their protection? That's a term for a tathagata, an accomplished and fully enlightened one. The safe and good path to be traveled joyfully is a term for the noble eightfold path. That is, having the right view, setting the right intention, speaking rightly, acting rightly, having the right livelihood, putting forth the right effort, cultivating right mindfulness, and establishing right concentration. So bhikkhus, the safe and good path to be traveled joyfully, it's been reopened by me. The wrong path, it's been closed off. The decoy has been removed. The dummy, destroyed. What should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them? That I have done for you, bhikkhus. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, bhikkhus. Don't delay, or else you might regret it later. This is my instruction to you. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. So there we have the two kinds of vitaka, the two kinds of thought. Um, any thoughts to start? Any comments or questions or ideas? Anything didn't make sense or any words clarified? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> well, let's take it from the top then. <clears throat> so we have this story of the Buddha before his enlightenment. And he says he thought it would be a good idea to, to do it this way. And, you know, <clears throat> we don't, all of these sutras, of course, we don't really, you know, we don't have the full story, but it would seem that this sutra is sort of describing the Buddha's invention of this way of doing meditation. And I say that because of this idea where he's like, it occurred to me, suppose I were to put these emotions and these feelings into these two different categories. And then he starts doing that. And then let's just start with the first one. Let's start with the main one. So of these three, <clears throat> he focuses first, of course, on kama, sensual desire. And as I'm often, you know, I mentioned this last week, but I want to kind of say it again or kind of clarify this again. The term kama, it is, it really is one of those terms that depending upon how you think of it, it really determines in a way what kind of Buddhist you are. And what I mean by that is, and this is what I kind of mentioned last week, in some traditions, in some Buddhist teachings, kama is exclusively sexual desire. 
And it's not just in Buddhism, of course, because I know that you're probably aware of this famous uh, Hindu text, the, the Kama Sutra. So the Kama Sutra, which is not a Buddhist sutra, but it is a treatise on lovemaking. It is a treatise on cultivating pleasurable sexuality. And it's called the Kama Sutra. So it's not just the Buddhists that, or some Buddhists, where sexuality is what this is all about. But I mentioned last week that you could actually be a different kind of Buddhist, and it's all sensual desire. So the desire to hear things, see things, smell things, taste things, touch things, think about things, but just activity, karmic activity, and the desire for pleasurable karmic activity and sensations. So that's another way to understand kama, and that would actually make you a certain kind of Buddhist, a pretty austere Buddhist, by the way. If, if you had that really kind of stoic, austere, ascetic relationship to all forms of sensuality, again, that's one definition of kama, and it's a way to be Buddhist, is to just not... Try not to delight in any sensual pleasures at all. So those are sort of two ways. It's just sex sexuality or it's all uh, stimula you know, sensual stimulation in that way. <clears throat> but for tonight, I want to kind of keep focusing on a sort of middle road approach to Kama. And that is basically about thinking more along the lines of addiction. And I mean that both in terms of like deep, deep addiction, like, you know, substance addiction and all kinds of like deep addictions. But I'm also just talking about like a kind of a real neediness about it. And what I mean is, is that let's let's take uh, alcohol. Alcohol consumption is a classic one. Of course, there is a addiction in a, a needing of it. But then there's also sort of a like a kind of addiction, which is that it's like, you know, I like to have my one glass of Chardonnay every evening. I'm not a, like a full-blown alcoholic and da 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 except, now this is where I want to draw our attention, except if I can't have my one glass of wine, I get very irritated and it ruins my whole night. So I need to have that in order for the evening to go well. So... That I would sort of put in a kind of addiction mode because there's a, a needing of it in order to be happy and an irri irritation when you don't have it. So that is sort of a problematic relationship perhaps with that thing. But my point is, is that we could do this practice and if you were doing this practice and let's, so let's say Alcohol was something that you had noticed that you didn't really didn't want to do it anymore. Like you realized that there was a problem. Well, now you can be, well, you can, in a meditative mode, you could do vitaka or vitarka. And that would be about watching out for the arising of the desire to drink the desire for inebriation, that needing of it. And one thing that you could do then is to be like, oh, look, there's that sensation of me desiring a sensual pleasure. There's that feeling of me needing that sensual pleasure. And let's just focus on alcohol consumption. It's a classic Buddhist one to think about. And so the thought would be, 
oh, look, here's this desire to get inebriated. But this desire for me to get inebriated, it just creates affliction for myself. It actually just creates agitation for myself. And perhaps more importantly, it creates friction with my family and friends. It, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for them. It doesn't really work for both of us in that way. And of course, it's not conducive to wisdom. Sorry, I'm trying to find the other part of that, right? It obstructs wisdom. It causes difficulties, indeed, and it leads away from nirvana. So my point is, is that the practice could be or could look like a seated meditation practice of mindful awareness where you're doing vitarka or vitaka, you're looking around, oh, look, the desire to get inebriated. Does that really help me? My experience has been that it just makes me ill, makes me vomit, makes me feel bad in the morning, causes all kinds of afflictions. My family doesn't like it when I'm drunk. We fight, we argue. So it's bad for us. It's bad for everybody. And through that contemplation about how it's not good for anybody involved, that could lead to its abandonment. And so rather than giving in to that urge and then drinking, we notice it, observe it, apply the insight that it is not beneficial to me or anybody else to do this, and then observe it passing away. It might be followed by another desire to do it, and you would keep doing it in that way. So that's the general kind of description of the bhavana, the work, and the way it works. In particular, before it gets too late, I want to draw our attention to that really, really simple but super important line, and it's where the Buddha says, whatever anyone frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. If they frequently think about this, that will become the inclination of their mind. And then he does says that again, but not with the negative things, but with the positive things. So this is it. And again, it's like kind of simple, but do we really, you know, behave accordingly in that way? And what I mean by that is, is, you know, if you were really interested in avoiding certain things, then the idea is, is it's about recognizing that if you keep thinking and pondering about that thing all the time, the mind will be inclined towards it. And if you never have thoughts of like compassion, the mind's never going to incline towards compassion in that way. So this is truly what they call mind training, which I guess we could talk about the beautiful metaphor. So regarding mind training, the Buddha introduces this metaphor of the cow herder. And this, by the way, this, this sutra or this particular aspect of the sutra, the cow herder, this kind of becomes a trope or a part of the Buddhist tradition. And it eventually kind of becomes like, um, well, you could see, you can see it in the 10 ox herding pictures of the Zen tradition, and you can see it in the 10 elephant stages of there's a Tibetan model of the elephant path, they call it. And it's also sort of about training the elephant or training the, the cows in that way. So the Buddha begins, and let me just kind of break down the structure of this sutra real quick. So the Buddha begins with these three unwholesome states, the state of being sensually desirous, pissed off, and violent or cruel, right? And in the first part, he's talking about that when those things arose, I realized that they were totally un unbeneficial, unbene totally not conducive to wisdom and nirvana, and so I abandoned them. And then the Buddha uses this analogy 
and basically says it's just like when the crops are in full like full bloom and the cow herder has to actually use a stick and keep prodding the cows to not go towards the crops so he's got to be active or the cow herder needs to be active needs to be like involved and there's a way in which it's kind of um um well that kind of i don't want to say aggressive because it's actually not meant to be aggressive but it is meant to be active actively tapping them on the sides all the time don't go near the crops don't go near the crops don't go near the crops so that's the buddha's analogy for working with these three unwholesome states it's like trying to keep the cows from going into the crops right then he shifts to the opposites of these so what they call renunciation which again is this this uh nekkakama so nekkakama not like not pursuing sensual desire, renouncing sensual desire, renouncing kama, and then the idea of not being pissed off, not being full of ill will, and not being cruel. So those ideas, again, can be thought of as being kind and being compassionate. So the Buddha talks about those three states arising, those three wholesome states arising. And there he realizes, oh, now let, let's take loving kindness. Let's shift to the second one. And so rather than being all pissed off, we're full of loving kindness. And the Buddha recognizes, huh, this feeling of loving kindness, this does not create any afflictions for me. Me being lovingly kind does not create any afflictions for other people. Me being lovingly kind, it's a win-win. It doesn't afflict either of us. And not only that, it's conducive to wisdom. It leads to nirvana. And that's true of compassion and it's true of renunciation. So the Buddha realizes that those three states, wholesome states, are again all good it's a win-win <laughs> being pissed off it's a lose-lose i lose and my family and friends lose when i'm pissed off that's the buddha's great realization is that wow we're both losing versus when i am lovingly kind it's a win-win when i'm compassionate it's a win-win maybe i should develop and incline my mind towards that which is a win-win situation all the time <laughs> so that's what his kind of realization is um regarding the arising of these wholesome states of mind and then he introduces the other part of the analogy where he says and this is just like when the crops have all been gathered together the crops have all been taken away. And he says, now, in order to be a cow herder, the cow herder can basically hang out at the bottom of a tree, which, of course, is a funny reference to, like, the Bodhi tree in that way, right? But he says, you can hang out at the bottom of a tree or just hang out in the open. Since, and now this is the quote, since the cow herder needs only to be mindful that the cows are there. So, too, there was a need for me only to be mindful that those wholesome states were there. So there's that idea of like, or the way that I read that, I read that as when the Buddha first started doing this practice, thoughts of ill will arose, thoughts of violence, thoughts of sensual desire arose. And then he would do the practice of contemplating them and realizing that they're not beneficial to anybody. But then every now and then thoughts of loving kindness would arise. And he says that thing about like, I could sit here and think about this for all day. I could sit here thinking about it 
all day and night. And it, there would be no problem with that. Now, what I'm pointing at, and it's kind of implied, or you kind of have to read between the lines. What he's kind of basically saying, or the way that I read it, he's basically saying when that, that thought of ill will arose, it's kind of like, this is not helping anybody. Let's get rid of this as quickly as possible. But when a thought of like loving kindness arises, oh no, let's pay attention to that. Let's let's stay with that. Maybe let's try to stay with that all day. And so there's a quick or or there's a desire, if you will, for a quick abandonment of unwholesome states. And there's a desire to sort of hold on to wholesome states. And the way that I understand what the Buddha is talking about with the metaphor of the cow herder is that eventually he doesn't need to be like, oh, look, a thought of loving kindness. That's good for me and that it's good for you. It's good for everybody. There's a way in which he's just aware that loving kindness, compassion and renunciation are present. And now I can just sort of kick back and I don't need to be so... Uh, vigilant in that awareness. And I think the presumption is, is that it's because the unwholesome states of sensual desire, ill will, and violence have subsided. They've basically gone away. And that's what then moves us into a position to start getting into the jhanas. Because we need to remember that any time the Buddha talks about the jhanas, it always begins with that phrase, um, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. Like, so you're not getting into a jhana if you are sort of really like in the realm of sensual uh, pleasures and desires in that way. Is, is That's the idea. And then, of course, we have the what is basically a stock series of paragraphs that are the description of the jhanas and then the three uh, true seeings or the three true knowledges, the knowledge of past lives, the knowledge of the basically rebirths of others, and the knowledge of the destruction of the taints, sensual desire, being and ignorance, which we've talked about in Dharmadur's past. Questions, comments, ideas about anything, <laughs> but particularly about meditation and the sutta. Uh, Lane? Okay, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, thanks. Um, so as a recovering doormat, I have struggled with loving kindness and compassions being a gateway for me to have no boundaries whatsoever. Fix me. That's my question. <laughs> How do we balance that? How do we balance our need to, um, you know, have compassion for a person who maybe has ill will for us yep. and wants to act on that ill will? My, I don't know if I'll be able to fix you, but my, one way to think about it, I would suggest to, to think about it this way. So loving kindness and compassion, both of them, I want to kind of imp or notice that they, for what the Buddhists are talking about, what the Buddha is talking about, to have loving kindness for someone, you don't need to be in the same room as them and you don't need to be engaged with them in any way, shape or form, but you can still be extending loving kindness towards them. And so my point is, is that 
we sort of have in generally speaking very generally speaking we have kind of basically three possible ways of relating to the other one way is with animosity and anger one way is with let's say loving kindness and then totally neutral, totally not angry at them, but not extending loving kindness, just total absolute neutrality. The thing that we would want as a boot as Buddhists or practicing the path in that way, what we would want to think about and consider is let's start with getting angry. Like, and I want to remind you, Lane, that what I'm talking about is not we're not in the same room as this person where it's about the way we feel about them and it's about noticing like as the buddha says noticing that anger sort of hurts and recognizing then that in me sitting here and remember again i'm all alone in my room they're not here and so it's a, i'm making a choice to sit here in anger and it hurts, it hurts my stomach, it hurts my chest, but I'm sitting here in anger. I could be neutral or I could d cultivate loving kindness. I think the Buddha is saying, of course, that to develop anger towards the person is not helpful for anybody. So then we're just left with these two options and while a lot of Buddhism is about neutrality, and I wouldn't exactly want to uh, dissuade you or dissuade anybody from developing neutral feelings, I actually think it's it's a it's an emotional space that we don't explore enough, which is just sort of neutrality. Usually, society is very po polar in that way. We know this. And so you can't just, you have to like hate things or love things. And there's not a lot of middle ground. And so to actually just be neutral would be a practice and it would be a form of cultivating something. It would be cultivating neutrality. But now let's give a little bit of thought to going that next step of extending loving kindness. And at this point that we really want to think about this, or I, th I, I put it this, I think about it this way. I kind of think about who or what I admire in this world. And I don't admire people who are angry. I, I feel compassion for them. I feel bad for them, but I don't admire them totally neutral people i don't actually admire them either and that's just me i'm just speaking honestly that that doesn't impress me it it's sort of i understand it's a safe place i get that but when i encounter somebody that's just very emotionless no emotion again i'm not really impressed or or whatever when I see somebody who is lo is lovingly kind, and not, not only that, but when they go that extra step and are lovingly kind, even towards people who are kind of jerks or assholes, I admire that myself. I see wisdom. I see, I I see the liberation in that. And so for me, it's like, oh. If I'm all alone in this room, I can get angry at this person. I can just sort of block them out and be neutral. But then there's this practice of actually developing and extending loving kindness toward them. And it's about just looking at whether we think that is wise, good cultivation for us. Now, Lane, I totally understand your question. I understand it very well. And it's why I wanted to remove us from the person that might be turning us into a doormat. Because 
the practice of loving kindness is actually about our heart. And the idea of the other person seeing and knowing that I'm being lovingly kind towards them and then taking advantage of that, like I get where that concern comes from. And it's why I wanted to put it totally as a solo practice and looking at our own heart that way. Yeah? Oh, good. Yeah. Yes, Robin. Um, I'm thinking um, about a um, some words in a prayer that say, um, resting the mind as it is without rejecting or accepting, you know, and, and allowing self-abiding awareness to arise. Um, so would that be um, the rejecting and accepting? Would this be maybe a, a sort of a, a more advanced um, um, are, are we sort of, sort of passing over this stage of analyzing and just saying, okay, I'm going to be in, in this natural state of the mind as it is without accepting and rejecting? Is that bypass, trying to bypass this step, do you think? Um, not exactly. You don't happen to have a source for that prayer, do you? Uh, yes, it's the... Um, it's the Sahama Tabhadra. I don't pronounce that right. The uh, aspiration prayer of the primordial Buddha of the Nyingma tradition. So I, I kind of guessed or figured that that mm. was where you were coming from. And I think that'll actually be a really important point to talk about. So Robin, what you are, the prayer you're referring to and the tradition you're referring to is indeed very advanced Buddhism. No, you know, Buddhism is usually divided into like early, middle, and late. What you're describing is very late period Buddhism in that way. But I, but your question affords me the opportunity to talk about something that I wanted to mention. And what it is, is that a part, a very, very big part of the Hinayana the Theravada, the early form of Buddhism, the practice, and I mean the practice of early Buddhism is observing the arising, abiding, and ceasing of dharmas. And what they mean is exactly what we talked about tonight. When they say observing the arising of a dharma, they mean observing the arising of a feeling of being pissed off. And then they're talking about observing the state of being pissed off. And you want to be able to observe it going away. And, you know, just to make this even more like direct, another example would be comma, but in the sense of sexuality, of like getting a little horny. The idea would be, it would be like, oh, here's that emotion. Observing that emotion and basically waiting until that emotion subsides, not giving into it, not masturbating, not all of that and watching it subside, but just sitting with it until it subsides. So with all of these different emotions and these different states of mind, Early Buddhism, the practice is to observe the arising, abiding, and ceasing of dharmas. But then we get to the middle period of Buddhism. This, this is gone. We're not talking about this anymore because now we're talking about things like the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Mahayana Sutras that talk about the emptiness of all dharmas. There aren't actually dharmas exactly. And most importantly, for the Mahayana tradition, there isn't the self that I think there is. So who's angry? Who is angry at what? And at that point, there is no arising and abiding and ceasing of dharmas. And in fact, from the Mahayana point of view, it's, it's kind of 
counteractive to even think about the arising, abiding, and ceasing of dharmas, because we are reifying phenomena that's empty and doesn't exist to begin with. So that's where in the Mahayana tradition, what we really want to observe and be aware of is either emptiness or dependent origination, which are two ideas that go very closely together. But in the idea of pratitya sam utpata, so the very idea of sam utpata, of arising together, that means that a dharma doesn't arise solo and just whoop, abide and cease. All dharmas are actually sam utpata. They are all arising together, or not arising, but they are co-arising in that sense. And so that's why in the Mahayana, they're like, no, 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 you don't want to observe the arising and biting and ceasing of dharmas. And then that idea of emptiness and that idea of that there is no arising or abiding or ceasing is what leads to the deve more developed and the prayer that you're just talking about or that you mentioned in terms of resting and abiding in that kind of natural, non-dual, empty state that is the case anyways. Yeah? Oh, good. Again, thank you, Robin, because I wanted to mention that this sutra is all about arising, abiding, and ceasing of dharmas, and it's a great practice. I'm, I, I'm the type of teacher that teaches all three vehicles. Like There is a lot of value to observing this. There's a lot of value, though, in understanding the emptiness of dharmas as well. Any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Yeah, Maria. Um, I just wanted to um, mention that I am fascinated by this idea of the, um, the practice sort of going on its own or this perpetual motion in the practice um, and how we can sort of lean in one way or the other and sort of help it get to that point. And I think it applies to other aspects too. Like I've seen some of this start to happen in my own practice and like, um, for instance, with like selfishness and generosity um doubt and faith um the more you sort of rest with the wholesome or the more onward leading the more the other unwholesome or less so sort of fades um and so it's really cool and i think this is what i was talking about when i was talking about how i was sick at one point and i couldn't i couldn't like really sick and I couldn't practice and I came back when I came back to the cushion it was like the practice was sort of doing it on its own and I described the analogy that I used was a um moving sidewalk in an airport yeah so. thank you nice thank you yeah no yeah, I just it just what Maria said. I've been thinking about something that related in the sutra. I'm not sure if this is exactly what you were talking about, Maria, but it reminds me of that, which is the the little bit about the herdsman just being able to just chill out at some point. I think that's what you're talking about. And yeah, and I'm just I love that visual, and I love uh, and I'm. I'm sort of curious uh, whether, I guess I'm, yeah, I'm curious and I'm asking myself, but I'll ask you too, is it just sort of as Maria was describing the, you know, the, the seeding of the, of the, you know, wholesome states that slowly kind of 
crowds out the unwholesome ones or like a for, for sort of by habit or is there some kind of it's almost like some kind of alchemical process where you're you're mm. just getting the positive feedback from the the wholesome states along with you know some wisdom of knowing that you know things change all the time which seems like a, a an important part of it you know so that when things aren't so smooth and easy you know to just not clench you know so i'm just thinking about that and curious about your thoughts um you know the one the one thought that comes to mind that i haven't mentioned for a long time it it's about how the word, so the, the real key word, and it's a word that we're sort of talking about. So a key idea in Buddhism, of course, is the idea of samskara, uh, habituation or conditioning, right? Behavioral conditioning, that's basically samskara. And what's interesting that I've shared with people is when when the Buddhist tradition was being translated into uh, Chinese for the Chinese culture, the word for samskara that they chose to use, a particular character pronounced uh, Xing. What's interesting, though, about that character in Chinese Buddhism is that it it does mean conditioning or samskara, but it's also the same word that is used for practice, to practice. And what I, when I realized that, like a long time ago when I was first studying Chinese Buddhism, and I was like, oh, look, they use the same word for that. It actually made me go back and sort of reread all of Buddhism. And it made me realize that it's like, conditioning isn't good or bad, it's, what's happening but what you are conditioned to <laughs> determines the good or bad thing but the being conditioned is not necessarily the bad thing and so that kind of is very much represented in this text in our sutra tonight what the buddha says that whatever somebody frequently thinks about that's what the mind inclines towards and it's just a simple matter of repetition in that way on that note, really quickly, I did want to mention the arising of a of what the Buddha called renunciation. So the opposite of sensual desire, this arising of, of renunciation. I wanted to say this earlier, I just noticed my note. An interesting way to think about that, it's about like if you've ever struggled with anything, again, whether it may, may be alcohol or what have you, you know, you might have reached that point where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. That's the arising of a sense of renunciation. You in that moment where you're like, I don't want this. That's that good, wholesome feeling that should in a way be cultivated because the I want it, I want a drink, I need a drink, I, is sort of keeps getting repeated all the time. And then that's what the mind inclines towards in that way. But in that moment where you're like, I don't want to do this when I'm done with this. That's the renunciation that if you keep cultivating that, the mind will become so habituated towards that, that at a certain point you can kick back under the tree and there won't be that inclination anymore. Now, I know alcoholism is a tricky one because there's certain bodily things that can happen regarding the actual physical dependency. So I'm talking more broadly about that kind of, you know, habitual problem, not a actual physical addiction, which I totally respect in that way. So, but I just wanted to point out what that would mean to have the arising of, of a thought of renunciation it's that wholesome thought of i don't want to do this anymore so. all right everybody
So we did it again. We made it through another sutta. Um, and that'll do it for tonight's Dharma Doors. Thanks for being here. Thanks for... Thank you, Michael. Uh, Thank you, Dom. Thank thanks. you, Michael. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Have a great night, everybody. I'll see you next week.